Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, Book 5, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Chapter 4, What Caspian Did There. Next morning, the Lord Burn called his guests early, and after breakfast he asked Caspian to order every man he had into full armour. And above all, he said, let everything be that be as trim and scoured as if it were the morning of the first battle in a great war between noble kings with all the world looking on. This was done, and then in three boatloads Caspian and his people, and Burn and a few of his, put on their narrow ha- put on put out for narrow haven. The king's flag flew in the stern of his boat, and his trumpeter was with him. When they reached the jetty at Narrowhaven, Caspian found a considerable crowd assembled to meet him. This is what I sent word about last night, said Byrne. They are all friends of mine, and honest people. And as soon as Caspian stepped ashore, the crowd broke out into hurrahs and shouts of, Narnia! Narnia! Long live the king! At the same moment, and this was also due to Burns' messengers, bells began ringing from many parts, yet from many parts of the town. Then Caspian caused his banner to be advanced, and his trumpet to be blown and every man drew his sword, and set his face into a joyful sternness. And they marched up the street, so that the street shook, and their armour shone, for it was a sunny morning, so that one could hardly look at it steadily. At first, the only people who cheered were those who had been warned by Burns' messenger and knew what was happening and wanted it to happen. But then all the children joined in because they liked the procession and had seen very few. And then all the schoolboys joined in because they also liked processions and felt that the more noise and disturbance there was, the less likely they would be to have any school that morning. And then all the old women put their hands out of doors and windows and began chattering and cheering because it was a king. And what is a governor compared to that? And all the young women joined in for the same reason and also because Caspian and Drinian have, and the rest were so handsome, and then all the young men came to see what the young women were looking at, so that by the time Caspian reached the castle gate, nearly the whole town was shouting, and where Gumpus sat in the, sat in the castle, muddling and messing about, with accounts and forms and rules and regulations, he heard the noise. At the castle gate, Caspian's trumpeter blew a blast and cried, Open for the king of Narnia! Come to visit his trusty, well-beloved servant, the governor of the Lone Islands. In those days, everything in the islands was done in slovenly, slouching manner, in a slovenly, slouching manner. Only the little postern opened, and out came a tousled fella with a dirty old hat on his head instead of a helmet, and a rusty old pike in his hand. He blinked at the flashing figures before him. Can't seize <laughs> fish and sea. He mumbled, 
which was in his which was his way of saying you can't see his efficiency his deficiency no interviews without appointments except between 9 and 10 p.m. second saturday every month uncover before narnia you dog that's it. On cover before Narnia, you dog! Thundered the Lord Burn and dealt him a rap with his gauntleted hand, which sent his hat flying from his head. Here, what's it all about? began the doorkeeper. But no one took any notice of him. Two of Cassian's men stepped through the postern, and after some struggling with bars and bolts, for everything was rusty, flung both wings of the gate wide open. Then, king, uh, then the king and his followers strode into the courtyard. Here a number of the governor's guards were lounging about, and several more. They were mostly wiping their mouths came tumbling out of various doorways. Though their armour was in a disgraceful condition, these were fellows who might have fought if they had been led or had known what was happening. So this was the dangerous moment. Cassian gave them no time to think. Where is the captain? he asked. I am, more or less, if you know what I mean, said a languid and rather dandified young person without any armour at all. It is our wish, said Cassian, that our royal visitation to our realm of the Lone Islands should, if possible, be an occasion of joy and not of terror to our loyal subjects. If it were not for that, I should have something to say about the state of your men's armour and weapons. And it is. You are pardoned. Command a cask of wine to be opened, that your men may drink our health. But at noon tomorrow I wish to see them here in this courtyard, looking like men at arms, and not like vagabonds. To see it, see it on pain of our en extreme displeasure. The, the captain gaped, but Byrne immediately cried, Three cheers for the king! And the soldiers, who had understood about the cask of wine, even if they understood nothing else, joined in. Caspian then ordered most of his own men to remain in the courtyard. He, with Byrne and Drinian, and four others, went into the hall, behind a table at the far end, with various secretaries about him, sat his sufficiency, the governor of the Lone Islands, Gumpus, with a bilious looking man, with hair that once had been, that had once been red, and was now mostly grey, he glanced up at the strangers. He glanced up as the strangers entered and then looked down at his papers, saying automatically, No interviews without appointments except between 9 and 10 p.m. on second Saturdays. Cassian nodded to Byrne and then stood aside. Byrne and Drinian took a step forward and each seized one end of the table. They lifted it and flung it on one side of the hall, where it rolled over, scattering a cascade of letters, dossiers, ink pots, pens, sealing wax and documents. Then, not roughly, but as firmly as if their hands were pincers of steel, 
they plucked Gumpus out of his chair and deposited him facing it about four feet away. Caspian at once sat down in the chair and laid his naked sword across his knees. My lord, said he, fixing his eyes on Gampus, you have not given us quite the welcome we expected. I am the king of Narnia. Nothing about it in the correspondence, said the governor. Nothing in the minutes. We have not been notified of any such thing. All are regular, happy to consider any applications. And we are come to inquire into your sufficiency's conduct of your office, continued Caspian. There are two points especially on which I require an explanation. First, I find no record that the tribute due from these islands to the crown of Narnia has been received for about a hundred and fifty years. That would be a question to raise at the council next month, said Gumpus. If anyone moves that a commission of inquiry to be, and it be set up to report on the financial history of the islands at the first meeting next year, why, uh, why then? I also find it very clearly written in our laws, Caspian went on, that if the tribute is not delivered, the whole debt has to be paid by the governor of the Lone Island out of his private purse. At this, Gampus began to pay real attention. Oh, that's quite out of the question, he said. It is an economic impossibility, er, uh, your majesty. Must be joking. Inside. He was wondering if there were any way of getting rid of these unwelcome visitors. Had he known that Caspian had only one ship and one ship's company with him, he would have spoken soft words for the moment and hoped to have them all surrounded and killed during the night. But he had seen a ship of war sail down the strait yesterday and seen it signalling, as he supposed, to its consort. He had not then known it was the kingship, for there was not wind enough to spread the flag out and make the golden line visible, so he awaited further developments. Now he imagined that Caspian and the whole fleet at Burnsford. It would never have occurred to, Gamp to Gumpus that anyone would walk into Narrowhaven to take the islands with fewer than fifty men. It was certainly not at all the kind of thing he could imagine doing himself. Secondly, said Caspian, I want to know why you have permitted this abominable and unnatural traffic in slaves to grow up here, contrary to the ancient custom of and usage of our dominions. Necessary, avoidable, said his sufficiency, an essential part of the economic development of the island, I assure you. Our present birth of prosperity demands on it, that depends on it. What need have you for slaves? For export, your majesty. Sell them to Kalorman, mostly. And we have other markets. We are a great centre of the trade. In other words said Caspian. You don't need them. Tell me what purpose they serve except to put money into the pockets of such a of such a pug. Your Majesty's tender years, said Gumpus. 
with what was meant to be a fatherly smile. Hardly make it possible that you should understand the economic problem involved. I have statistics. I have graphs. I have... Tender my ears may be, said Cassian. I believe I understand the slave trade from within quite as well as your sufficiency. And I do not see that it brings into the islands meat or bread, or beer or wine, or timber or cabbages, or books or instruments, or music or horses or armour, or anything else worth having. But whether it does or not, it must be stopped. But that would be putting the clock back, gasped the governor. Have you no idea of progress or development? I have seen them both in an egg, said Cassian. We call it going bad in Narnia. This trade must stop. I can take no responsibility for any such measure, said Gumpus. Very well then, answered Cassian. We relieve you of your office. My Lord Byrne, come here. And before Gumpus quite realised what was happening, Byrne was kneeling with his hands between the king's hands and taking the oath to govern the Lone Islands in accordance with the old customs, rites, usages and laws of Narnia. <coughs> and Cassian said, I think we have had enough, govern uh, enough of governors, and may burn a duke, the duke of the Lone Islands. As for you, my lord, he said to Gumpus, I forgive you your debt for the tributes, but before noon tomorrow, you and yours must be out of the castle, which is now the Duke's residence. Look here, this is all very well, said one of Gumpus's secretaries. But suppose all you gentlemen stop play-acting and we do a little business. The question before us is really this. The question is, said the Duke, whether you and the rest of the rabble will leave without a flogging or with one, you may choose which you prefer. When all of this had been pleasantly settled, Caspian ordered horses of which there were a few in the castle, so very ill-groomed, and he, with Byrne, Andrinian, and a few others, rode out into the town, and made for the slave market. It was a long, low building near the harbour, and the scene which they found going on inside was very much like any other auction. That is to say, there was a great crowd, and Pug on a platform was roaring out in a raucous voice. Now, gentlemen, the lot 23, fine Terebinthian, agricultural labourer, suitable for the mines or the galleys, under 25 years of age, not a bad tooth in his head, good, brawny fellow, Take off his shirt, tack, and let the gentleman see. There's muscle for you. Look at the chest on him. Ten crescents from the gentleman in the corner. You must be joking, sir. Fifteen, eighteen. Eighteen is bid for lot twenty-three. Any advance on eighteen? Twenty-one. Thank you, sir. Twenty-one is bid. But Pug stopped and gaped when he saw the mail-clad figures who had clanked up to the platform. 
On your knees, every man, uh, every man of you, to the king of Narnia, said the duke. Everyone heard the horses jingling and stamping outside, and many had heard some rumour of the landing and the events at the castle. Most obeyed. Those who did not were pulled down by their neighbours. Some cheered. Your life is forfeit, Pug, for laying hands on our royal person yesterday, said Cassian. But your ignorance is pardoned. The slave trade was forbidden in all our dominions a quarter of an hour ago. I declare every slave in this market free. He held up his hand to check the cheering of the slaves and went on. Where are my friends? That dear little girl and the nice young gentleman, said Pug. With an ingratiating smile. Why they were snapped up at once. We're here, we're here, Caspian, cried Lucy and Edmund together. At your service, sire, piped Reaper Cheap from another corner. They had all been sold, but the men who had bought them were staying to bid for other slaves and so they had not yet been taken away. The crowd parted to let the three of them out, and there was great hand clasping and greeting between them and Cassian, between them and Cassian. Two merchants of Kalorman at once approached. The Kalorman have dark faces and long beards, They wear flowing robes and orange-coloured turbans, and they are a wise, wealthy, courteous, cruel, and ancient people. They bowed most politely to Cassian, and paid him long compliments, all about the fountains of prosperity, irrigating the gardens to, uh, of produce and virtue, and... things like that, but of course, what they wanted was the money they had paid. That is only fair, sirs, said Cassian. Every man who has bought a slave today must have his money back, Pug. Bring out our takings to the last minimum. A minimum is a fortieth part is the fortieth part of a crescent. Does your good majesty mean to beggar me? Does your good majesty mean to beggar me? Wine pug. You have lived on broken hearts all your life, said Cassian. And if you are beggared, it is better to be a beggar than a slave. But where is my other friend? Oh, him, said Pug. Oh, take him and welcome. Glad to have him off my hands. I've never seen such a drug in the market in all my born days. Priced him at five crescents in the end. And even so, nobody'd have him. Threw him in free with other with other lots, and still no one would have him. Wouldn't touch him. Wouldn't look at him. Tax bring out Sulky. Thus Eustace was produced, and Sulky, he certainly looked. For enough. No one would want to be sold as a slave. 
for though no one would want to be sold as a slave, it is perhaps even more galling to be a sort of utility slave whom no one will buy. He walked up to Caspian and said, I see, as usual, been enjoying yourself somewhere while the rest of us were prisoners. I suppose you haven't even found out about the British Consul. Of course not. That night they had a great feast in the castle of Narrowhaven and then... Tomorrow for the beginning of our real adventures, said Reaper Chief, when he made his bows to everyone and went to bed. But it could not really be tomorrow or anything like it, for now they were preparing to leave all known lands and seas behind them, and the fullest preparations had to be made. The dawn threader was emptied and drawn on land by eight horses over rollers, and every bit of her was gone over by the most skilled shipwrights. Then she was launched again, in victualled and water, and victualled and watered, as full as she could hold, that is to say, for twenty-eight days. Even this, as Edmund noticed with disappointment, only gave them a fortnight's eastward sailing before they had to abandon their quest. While all this was being done, Caspian missed no chance of questioning all the oldest sea captains whom he could find in Narrowhaven and learn if they had any knowledge or even any rumours of land further to the east. He pulled out many a flagon of the castle ale to weather beaten men and short grey with short grey beards and clear blue eyes and many a tall yarn he heard in return. But those who seemed the most truthful could tell no could tell of no lands beyond the lone island, and many thought that if you sailed too far East, you would come into surges of a sea without lands that swirled perpetually round the rim of the world. And that, I reckon, is where your Majesty's friend, your Majesty's friends, went to the bottom. The rest had only wild stories of lands inhabited by headless men, floating islands, waterspouts and a fire that burned along the water. Only one, to Reaper Chief's delight, said, and beyond that, Aslan country. And that's beyond the end of the world, and you can't get there. But when they questioned him, he could only say that he'd heard it from his father. Byrne could only tell them that he had seen his six companions sail away eastward, and that nothing had ever been heard from them, heard of them again. He said this when he and Caspian were standing on the highest point of Avra, looking down on the eastern ocean. I've often been up here of a morning said the Duke, and seen the sun come up out of the sea, and sometimes it looked as if it were only a couple of miles away, and I've about, and I've wondered about my friends, and wondered what they are really, what really is behind that horizon, nothing most likely, yet I am always half ashamed that I stayed behind, but I wish your majesty wouldn't go. We may need your help here. This closing the slave markets might make a new world war with Talorman. 
is what I foresee. My liege, think again. I have an oath, my lord duke, said Cassian, and anyway, what could I say to Reaper Chief? And that was chapter 4 of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Next time, chapter 5, The Storm and What Came of It. Until then, thanks for watching.